I'm here this morning. Good to see those who have not been able to attend for a while, who are ill. Thankful that you're back with us. Pray that that will continue. Some who've been far away on vacation. Glad to see that they're back. Good to have some visitors with us uh, this morning as well. Hope that you will stay around after services so we can get to know you a little better. Thank you for being here. Let's all turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We're going to read, or start reading in verse 1 and read down to verse 6. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. That's the context. And he states, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye, abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So Jesus uses this figure, which they would have been well uh, acquainted with. And any of us have done any outside labor, we know what he's talking about as well. And Jesus is the true vine. His disciples are those branches. If those would continue to abide in him, speaking of his disciples, if they remained faithful, in other words, they would be saved. If they chose not to, you know what it's like to have a, a tree or a, a flower bush or something like that and it's no longer producing. Maybe one of the branches isn't. Well, you cut it off and you set it to the side. And they are, as Jesus stated, they will be burned. And he's implying everlasting destruction in the fires of hell here. Now I said all that to say this, and we'll come back to this passage in a minute. There are plenty of people, religious folks, who believe in the doctrine of once saved, always saved. And I would have to state, and it is spoken of as a very comforting doctrine. But if you think about what it is teaching, that once one is saved, they can never, ever fall from grace. No matter how they live their lives, they cannot be lost. Eternal salvation will be theirs. And I've thought in the past that if I was actually going to believe a false doctrine, this is it. This would be it. Because that means after I obeyed the gospel, I can live my life any way I want to. And I'll still die in a safe state. And there's a lot of consequences to that doctrine. And we'll talk about some of those consequences. One, you think of some of the most evil men who ever lived. Think of Adolf Hitler and the millions that were murdered by his orders. If he had obeyed the gospel, guess where? He would be right now. Well, he would be in paradise. That's the conclusion. That's the consequence of this doctrine. And we have probably talked to people, friends, people that we work with, that believe this doctrine. And 
these are individuals that have been so ingrained with this doctrine that it's hard, even showing them the truth where this doctrine is false, for them to come out of that false doctrine and believe what God's word teaches. But how do we do that? How do we answer that? We'll look at some of those uh, answers this, uh, this morning. I'd like for us to look, and briefly, look at the doctrine of this itself. It is referred to also, once saved, always saved, as perseverance of the saints, as we understand. The impossibility of apostasy is another phrase. It, has been, uh, it was made famous by John Calvin, who lived in the 1500s. He believed this. He taught it. It is uh, prominent through a lot of the Protestant denominations in our day and time as well. And it comes in different forms. We briefly touched on one of those forms in Bible class. One states that an individual cannot be lost once God has predetermined that they are going to be saved. God predetermines certain individuals to be saved and he predetermines those individuals who are going to be lost according to their teaching. I know of a man who grew up in the Presbyterian faith and this is what he was brought up believing. And he got to that age of accountability and he was full of dread. They said, you will see a sign or something will happen that you'll know that you're in that saved state. God's predetermined that you're going to be saved. He never heard that little voice. He never saw that sign. This is a doctor that had people terrified. He eventually obeyed the gospel of Christ, but he still remembers what he was taught. Predetermined that some are going to be saved also means there's going to be those who are predetermined that they're going to be lost, and there's nothing that you can do. That is an ungodly doctrine. And of course the the average belief is once one is saved, they can never fall away. They can never be lost, no matter how much or what kind of sins they continue to commit. Now, they have some arguments because they, without a doubt, understand. They know that there are scriptures in the Bible that teach the opposite of that. As Bible students, we understand that one verse in the scripture will not contradict another verse. If there's any contradiction, it's our problem. We need to go back to the drawing board, as the old saying states, and restudy it. But one verse does not contradict another passage, and yet this false doctrine and every false doctrine in one form or another does contradict God's word at one place or another. But what they say is if the scriptures indicate that someone saved became lost, that must imply that the person has never been saved. They weren't really saved. They really did not believe what was taught them. They just like went through the motions, if you will. They never were saved. That's how, that's the dodge, if you will, that they get around this doctrine. And there is another uh, belief that's not talked about as much, and that is the child of God merely falls away from a temporal divine favor, but not from eternal life. They'll still be saved eternally. But some favors here on this earth they will not receive. Where is that taught in the scriptures? It's not. And they know it. Now the consequences of this doctrine we, we just stated. This is a doctrine that's supposed to be full of comfort. However, 
It has no biblical substance to it whatsoever. And this is why we are not just to read what the Bible teaches. We are not just to accept what someone is teaching us, but we need to study the Bible for itself, for ourselves, that we can know what the truth is. No matter how versed someone is in the Bible, he can teach false doctrine. And if we're not well versed in it, we might accept it. I remember one friend of mine used to tell me, well, my pastor, quote pastor, would never teach me something that's false. Really? That's taking a big gamble. That's taking a big chance on your eternal soul. I don't want to do that, and neither do you. Consequences. If this doctrine is true, what in the world are we doing here this morning? You don't have to be. Why would we give up our means like we just did as the gospel teaches us to do, as God has prospered us on the first day of every week? Why do that? If we don't, if we still can't be lost. We'll have more money in our pocket at the end of the month. The works that we're involved in here in all congregations are godly works. Why? You can't be lost. We do not have to change. You remember when we obeyed the gospel, we believed that Jesus was the Son of God. John 8, 24. If we don't do that, it doesn't matter about the rest. We're going to die lost. But we also were to repent of our sins. And that is a doctrine that teaches, the Bible teaches that we are to have a change of mind that leads to a change of action or a change of lifestyle. As one brother used to put it, we are going to bend our stubborn will and bring it into subjection to God's will. We're going to be obedient to him. The sins that we've committed in the past, we're going to quit committing them. We're going to live for him. That old man of sin, that's been cast away. We've taken that off. We put on the new man. But according to this doctrine, why? Continue to live in sin. I can continue to sin. I can continue to drink, do drugs, to fornicate, to lie, cheat, steal, even murder. And I'm still going to be saved. That is not what God's holy word teaches at all. Nothing even close to it. It teaches the exact opposite. Well, let's notice them resting of the scriptures that they do or twisting of the scriptures that they are involved in. We know that Satan and his followers have been twisting the scriptures going all the way back to Adam and Eve. Even when uh, Jesus was being tempted, he did that as well. Let's notice John chapter 6. Now, I'm going to only mention a couple of passages that they go to to try to, try to prove their doctrine. But a couple will suffice. John chapter 6, beginning in verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Some will say that this is proof that an individual who comes to Christ can never be cast out. They cannot die lost. They will die eternally saved. Now, is that what this doctrine is teaching, or this verse is teaching, I should say? Because if it is, we have, we have a contradiction in other verses. Could it be that this verse is basically stating those who come to the Lord and remain faithful to him will be saved? Because that is what the scriptures teach. Go back to John 15, verse 4, and that phrase, abide in me. What does that mean, to abide? The word abide means to dwell, 
to be and remain united with him. Jesus himself stated, not everyone that cometh to me that saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, Matthew 7, 21. It's more than just saying that we believe in him. Good works that we've done. We need to be doers of the word and not hearers only, as James stated. In John 15, 6, what happens if we choose not to abide in him? That passage states, you remember that we are going to be cast out. To cast forth, where? In the fire. And they are going to be burned eternally. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit. This is one of the verses that teaches that this doctrine is false. You remember that the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle to the churches of Galatia. And the reason that he wrote it, as we all know, is they were turning from the gospel of Christ into another gospel, which was not another. But there were false teachers that had crept in, and they were teaching that you had to also obey the law of Moses to be saved. In Galatians 5, 4, Paul writes, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. How do you not understand that? I can take someone off the street and have them read that who has really no knowledge of the scriptures and guess what? They'll probably get it right. You have to be taught wrong to believe wrong. Just like you have to be taught right to believe right. But there's people out there who have been taught wrong all of their life. It's a doctrine that is false. It's a doctrine that they're parents believed, that their grandparents believed. It is hard for them to think, my parents, my grandparents were wrong. Some of them will not even listen to us for very long, but we still must try. Now they had been first called into the grace of Christ, going back to Galatians chapter 1 verse 6, but we're now following after another gospel. That wasn't Christ. The word fallen means just that. It means to fall off or fall from. What had they fallen from? Now Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things. They had fallen from his grace. They had fallen from the hope of salvation. They were lost. Someone asked a question. I thought it was a good question. In the form of if, if being in grace denotes salvation, Romans 5, 2 and other passages, if it does that, that it does, would it not also be true that falling from grace denotes the opposite? That one is now condemned? Yes. If not, why not? Let's turn over to John chapter 10. Words of our Lord and Savior. Notice with me starting in verse 27 of this chapter. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So here's another passage that they go to, similar to John 6, and they state, here's evidence. One who has obeyed the gospel can never fall away, never fall from grace, never be lost. Now is that true? 
These verses do teach the assurance of salvation. But as one person stated, assurance does not equal unconditional security. It's still our choice. Unlike the unbelieving Jews that Jesus was discussing these things with, his sheep, true sheep, heard his voice and followed him. And following him means they were following his teachings. They were being obedient to his commands. That's what made them his sheep or his disciples, true followers of his. Remember to whom the promise is given, those who hear my voice and do what? Follow me. That word follow is a verb. Keep on following me. Keep on being obedient to my words. It's not a one-time thing. It's not, well, once you're saved, you don't have to follow him anymore. That's false. And notice verse, uh, well, let's continue this thought. This passage does not remove, nor does this passage in John 6 remove our will, our free will to choose to remain faithful to him or choose not to remain faithful to him. This false doctrine really takes that away. You know, it is true that no one can remove us from the love of God as far as the world, the people in it, the devil. But we can remove ourselves from that hope of salvation, which is also taught in the scriptures. If you have to twist the scriptures to prove your doctrine, then you have a twisted doctrine. Plain and simple. If what they taught was true, then John 3.16 is worded incorrectly. Remember how it reads. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him cannot perish. Well, that's what it should say if their doctrine is true, but it doesn't say that. It says should not. There's a huge difference between cannot and should not. The big difference. We need to stick to the scriptures, to God's word, and not the teachings of man. Well, let's notice a few examples of the scriptures that prove that this doctrine is false. We already mentioned Galatians 5.4. I remember a number of years ago, having a discussion with uh, an individual who was Baptist. It is a person that we had business with. And he had actually been a Baptist missionary in foreign countries. And we were talking about this doctrine. And I brought up, what about Simon? Most, most of us do. What about Simon? And his answer was what they normally will give. He wasn't really saved. Which if you're in his shoes, you would have to say that. And my answer is, well, God's word said he was. But he didn't have an answer for that. And they don't. In Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 24, gives us the account of, of Simon. We refer to him as Simon the Sorcerer because evidently that's how he made his money doing those things before. Remember that Philip went down from Jerusalem to Samaria and he began to work miracles and preach the gospel of Christ and people began to believe. Now here you have this individual who said he was a sorcerer. Now he's seeing these miracles being performed. But he also obeyed the gospel. Notice with me Acts chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. Well, let me turn to it first. 
Acts chapter 8. I'm sure we are all pretty well familiar with this passage of scripture. Verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. What was he baptized into? What did he believe? Verse 12. Speaking also of the Samaritans. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now when you read these passages of scripture and you read how Simon believed the same thing, there's nothing mentioned, as far as I could see, that his belief was any different than the Samaritans. Nothing would lead us to believe that, well, he didn't really believe. The Holy Spirit inspired the writers to write that he did. He did believe. He was baptized. His was just as genuine as theirs. And of course, here's where he sins. Act 18 and uh, Acts, uh, verse 18 and 19. What he tried to do was to attempt to buy the power of, that the Holy Spirit gave the apostles, the laying on of hands to impart a miraculous gift to one who had been baptized into Christ, these new converts. And Peter rebuked him, and Peter rebuked him rather harshly. Verse 20 and 21. Notice in verse 20, Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. Do a study on that word perish. Because thou hast thought that the gift of money may be purchased, the gift of God may be purchased with money. Now here is also he tells Simon what he needed to do. And that was to repent. Why would he tell someone who wasn't a Christian to repent? Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which he has spoken come upon me. So he had to repent of trying to buy this gift and that repent means that change of mind that leads to a change of action. Nothing in this text tells us that he didn't really believe. A.T. Robinson in his commentary, and I, I appreciate a lot of the good that he's done translating the, the Greek into the English, but he was a Baptist. He believed once saved, always saved. And it's always interesting when you read these so-called scholars who are denominationalists. And when it comes to a certain passage that they don't agree with, they've got to twist the meaning. Or they will give it the Passover. They will just pass over that. But Robertson stated in his commentary that Simon was an unconverted man in spite of his profession of faith and baptism. Where is that talk? Nowhere. We're talking about how people will insert their doctrine into the scriptures. That's what takes place here. And if we're really talking about those who sin, what about Judas Iscariot? If this doctrine is true, you know where he is right now? Judas is in paradise. Once saved, God would say. Has to be that. That's the consequence. That's the conclusion you have to come up with. So he's still in paradise. And one day he's going to spend all eternity in heaven with the Lord whom he betrayed. 
Now that's ludicrous. Plain and simple. One of the original 12s, well, he didn't really believe. One of the original 12 disciples that Jesus handpicked, he was numbered with them. Peter writes in, first, in Acts chapter 1. He was numbered with the apostles. A disciple. A follower. And even before his betrayal, there are some things that are said about him that were not good. Jesus talking about those he had picked. One of them was even a devil. He's also referred to as a thief. And in John 17, 12, Jesus refers to him as the son of perdition. You know what that word perdition means? It ain't good. That's what it means. According to the Greek, Thayer's Greek lexicon, it means ruin and destruction which consists of eternal misery in hell. That's his outcome. In Acts chapter 1, Verse 25, Peter states that Judas went to his own place. We know that where that place was. They will say that even though he betrayed the Lord, and he didn't really repent of it, but he went out and he committed suicide by hanging himself, he still saved. <sighs> okay. I did like what A.T. Robertson said about this. This was a passage for him that was basically ungetterable. He couldn't get around it. And what he states, there is no doubt in Peter's mind, remember he was inspired by God to write this, there's no doubt in Peter's mind of the destiny of Judas, nor of his own guilt. He made ready his own birth and went to it. He also stated that Peter's description was worthy of Dante's Inferno. He couldn't get past it. He had no answer for it. Then there's 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. We are familiar with this. Now, by the way, this is a side point. It's not going to cost you any more money. It's not going to, well, it is going to take a little more time up. We all go on reviews on the internet about a product that we're going to look for. We do. We, a lot of times, take it with a grain of salt. However, when there's a product that we're going to buy and everybody says, oh, this is great, you need to buy it, well, maybe so. Or if it's really bad and everybody's writing in that, we don't want to buy it. When we're reading the scriptures and so many verses point out that this is false doctrine, why would we not believe it? So, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, watch it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Pretty descriptive. So individuals who escaped to flee from, to flee away from, what? The pollutions of the world, the sins that are involved in it. They obeyed the gospel. They were the called out, consecrated to service to God now. They were called out through the scriptures, the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If they return to the world of sin as it states, they are, what's that word, again entangled. They had been entangled in the past, but they had come out of it. But now it states they're entangled again and overcome by the sins of the world. 
The latter end is worse than the beginning. Basically, you should never even obey the gospel than to turn from it. One cannot escape from something that they were never part of. They were in the world. They had escaped from it. Then they turned away from it. You can't turn away from something that you're not a part of or involved in. They had been faithful Christians, but they chose not to remain faithful. Free will, once again. Verse 21 again, after they have known it, the truth, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. That's so simple to understand. It truly is. So understandable. Hebrews 10, 26 through 27, that's another passage that we could look at. But the consequences of this doctrine, and we'll close with this point, it nullifies most of what the Bible teaches. God gave instructions at the very beginning with Adam and Eve, commands that they were to follow. He's always given commands for people to follow. Mount Sinai, children of Israel received commands. And they received a, a promise. If they were faithful to him, God would continue to bless them. But also he states, if they fell away, he would punish them. Well, why state that? Because it's true. Book of uh, 1 Corinthians was written so much for the problems that were going on with the church at Corinth and how they could overcome those problems. Like the man who had his father's wife. By the way, if one saves, is always saved, why would he have to give up that wife? He could keep her. But why teach this if it's not true? Brother Diane Woods mentioned that there are over 2,000 warnings of apostasy in the Bible. Over 2,000. Why? If once saved, always saved, is a true doctrine of God's holy word. Because as they say in the South, it ain't. It's just not there. Simply put, the doctrine of once saved, always saved removes responsibility from the child of God because it allows them to live any way they want. Why repent then? To turn from the world to turn toward him if it doesn't matter. Like all false doctrine, it gives false hope. And it actually takes away hope from those who are looking for it. We know that we have hope through obedience to God's holy word, Titus 1, 2. That we do have the promise of eternal life if we believe that he's the son of God. We repent of our sins, confess his name before others, are baptized for remission of those sins, and we remain faithful to him for the rest of our lives. Think about 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Importance of being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what is achieved in eternal life. This is what we have to do. Can we choose not to die in that safe state? We can't. As Christians, we can go back into the world. And we'll be lost if we don't repent of that. But we can have that hope in the scriptures that does give us comfort that eternal life will be ours through his process of obeying his holy word and remaining faithful. If you're here this morning, do you want that hope? Are you lost? If you're not a child of God, a New Testament Christian, if you haven't obeyed God's plan of salvation, you have no hope of eternal life. But you can. We just stated how. And for those of us who are New Testament Christians, if we've fallen away, if we've brought shame or reproach on the Lord's church, we know that we can publicly repent of that. And we will pray for that individual, and that individual will be forgiven of their sins. That's your need this morning. We hope and pray that you will come forward. Let's all stand and sing.